Uh, session three, as you can see, risk reduction through data analysis, modeling, and simulation. This one might actually sound like it's the most dry, but I assure you it is not. We're going out with a bang at the end of the day. I'm excited about this panel. Anne has something lined up. She's going to start with, with a great video. I'm not going to give it away. I was captivated. I've watched it four times. OK, that's how much I like this video. Maybe I, I'm overselling it. OK, you'll hate it. <laughs> Keep your expectations low. It'll totally stink. OK, so with that in mind, this, this panel is looking at a couple of things. Are we collecting the right data? What is the right data? That's a really good question that we grapple with all the time. Uh, what are we doing with data? There's a lot of framing questions. And Anne is going to kick this off with her, with her grace and elegance that she brings to her job. It's been such a pleasure to meet you over the last couple of years through the work with the IRF. So when I would asked her for something more that was in her bio that I could talk about, I got two factoids. One was that, like most good Norwegians, she has a cabin in Norway. But her cabin actually has 21 beds and five floors. So my proposal here is the next IRF general meeting, we're going to her house. OK, that's where we're going. And then the other one that I thought was really, really interesting, because I can say a lot about her career and, and what she brings to the job, but she, she has a lot of integrity that clearly started when she was younger. She, started, uh, she actually taught for a time when she was 24 in a prison. So I don't know how that relates to what you're doing right now, but I think it was a really interesting start to what's been a great career for you. Thank you for hosting this panel. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alison. OK. Um, the last session, session of the day is actually about data and analysis. Um, and uh, as it says, uh, do we collect the right data? And do we use the data in a correct way? Uh, what kind of data do we need to reduce risk? And um, we know that we can both use and misuse uh, the data. Uh, so there is a lot of questions here, and I hope we will manage to answer some of them, uh, maybe not all. But uh, I uh, think that we will have uh, a better insight in those uh, questions and those themes that is uh, on the screen today. Uh, we will hear from uh, David Kaplan from NASA, from Walt Fennell from um, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and from Eric Levin from the Nuclear Energy. But first of all, we will have a video. Uh, this video is uh, made by the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Among the peaks along the Lysefjord, Kjærag is the highest, 1,020 meters above sea level. At the end of a vast stony plateau, you will find Kjærag Botten. This boulder has become wedged in a big crevasse over a drop of almost 1,000 meters. Tens of thousands of people from all over the world take the spectacular hike up to this landmark every year. Many of them step onto the boulder. Others decide not to. This is the first time I've been up here, but I always wanted to stand on Sherag Bolton. It must be a fantastic feeling. A kick. But how dangerous is it actually? How big is the risk? Nobody has ever fallen off Kjærad Bolton. My analysis shows that the risk of falling is 0.00000001, which is very low. Concluding that the risk is too high is irrational. That gives too much decision weight to a negligible probability. Driving a car, for example, is much more dangerous. Standing on Carl Bolton is safe. But if this is so safe, 
why do I have doubts? If I try it, one of two things can happen. Either everything goes well and I get safely onto the boulder, or I fall off. I can't know which of them will happen until I make the attempt. The risk is clearly there. On the 27th of January 1967, the crew of Apollo 1 were going to conduct a routine test. But something not foreseen happened. Apollo astronauts Roger Chaffee, Edward White and Gus Grissom lose their lives in a tragic flash fire aboard their grounded space capsule. None of the many hundreds of NASA experts had foreseen that something like this could happen. But it did happen. Here is a dice. If I throw a six, I win. And you have to pay me 1,000 kroner. But if I throw one, two, three, four, or five, you win, and I have to pay you 10,000 kroner. And you can play as many times as you like. Sounds okay? Sounds fine. According to my analysis, the probability of winning is five to six. In other words, the possibility, chance to make money is very great. It would be completely irrational not to play. Shall we play? <laughs> Why do you think I'm winning every time? I don't know. There's one thing you haven't taken into account. This is not a standard dice. It always comes up six. Here, you try. You took it for granted that the dice was fair. What does that do to your analysis? Well, the uh, analysis was based on an assumption which turned out to be wrong. A very important aspect of the risk wasn't revealed. The uh, analysis was therefore inadequate and uh, misleading. So what about Sherag Bolton? What's missing in that analysis? One thing he hasn't thought about is the person who is going to stand on the boulder. For all he knows, I could have terrible balance or suffer from vertigo. I could panic standing out there. And what about the local conditions? It's windy. He hasn't taken that into account either. What if there's a gust of wind just when I jump down onto the boulder? Or it could begin to rain. And my shoes. He has no idea what their soles are like. And something totally unexpected could happen. Something surprising which throws me completely off balance. This must be risky, or I wouldn't be in doubt. You only talked about low probability, but you knew far too little about the conditions up here. You didn't consider the possibility that something surprising could happen. Your analysis didn't show us the full picture. It provides a false sense of security. Despite the risk, I'm here. I am in doubt, because I really, really want to step onto that boulder. Just two years after the Apollo 1 accident, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Standing out on the boulder would be a dream come true. A fantastic experience. And what if I don't do it? 
The original risk analysis was static, but risk can't be described that way. It exists and changes all the time because our knowledge has changed. And sometimes it's worth taking the risk, but the risk is always there. actually giving a hand to this uh, film is, is great. It's uh, the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association, as I said, that made it. I think it's uh, a really good way of uh, uh, putting uh, the analysis and the data uh, into a bit of a new pers perspective. So um, <clears throat> uh, I'll uh, start up uh, with my presentation. Um, there we are, uh, giving the approach on some of the issue related to data and analysis from the Petroleum Safety Authority. Um, and I think also having uh, this session without showing some, some real data, uh, that wouldn't work. So I will have some slides with some, some data and some figures. Uh, but first, um, our regulatory system in Norway is based on functional uh, requirements, on goal-based requirements. We mean that this gives the industry uh, the possibility to choose good solutions. Uh, it plays the uh, responsibility on the uh, industry and the company itself so that it handles its operation and it handles its safety, and thereby the risk. What we in the Petroleum Safety Authority do is to uh, look at a um, project with, with data. It's called Trends in Risk Level. Uh, it is uh, an area where we collect the data from the industry and to look at the trends uh, and to then uh, identify what kind of measure is needed. This project or this activity, it's more than a project actually, was initiated in 1999 and it has been developed by uh, different kind of areas, different data and, and the approach has uh, developed. Um, uh, it is an important uh, management tool for all the participants. This is a uh, uh, cooperation with the industry, uh, both the uh, Norwegian Oil and Gas Association and the unions and, and others to look into uh, the data to, to, to find out how to use it. Uh, the uh, findings from these data that I will show some part of um, uh, make the basis for our supervisionary activity and also for the uh, companies uh, to identify measures to reduce risk. Before we had this, uh, we had a lot of arguing and discussion about what is the risk level uh, and used more or less all the time to, uh, to discuss what, what is the risk here. Now, with this uh, data and this analysis, it's uh, a possibility to, uh, to agree quite easily on the level and then have time to, reduce what, to, to discuss what do we need to reduce the risk. This activity includes both quantitative and qualitative uh, methods. We look at the uh, uh, defined hazard and accident conditions, uh, indicators for major accident risk. We look at uh, other data uh, like the work accidents. Uh, we also look into uh, noise exposure, for example, other um, indicators for working environment and occupational hygiene and health uh, issues. Uh, we use questionnaires, uh, interviews, field works, and other studies as well. Uh, so let's look at some, some data. And it's, in a way, it's not the 
the results itself that is important here uh, and it might be a bit difficult to read uh, all this but it will be available afterwards. Uh, so it's more uh, an indication on, on kind of data that we gather and that we look at. It's a quite busy slide but it shows uh, the defined hazard and accident um, conditions. Uh, and it uh, contains of uh, hydrocarbon leaks on uh, um, uh, construction damages, on uh, different well incidents, and um, uh, ships on collision course, uh, and others. And what we do, uh, we then gather, and this is, is just numbers, so we gather the numbers of near misses and incidents, and we see that the trend is uh, quite good in one way, but it's still, as you see, quite a, a number of, of accidents and near misses uh, happening. One of those are, whoops. Okay, it missed the uh, hydrocarbon releases, but it's uh, in here the uh, the, on the bottom, the blue one. That has been one uh, indicator that uh, both uh, we as the regulators and the industry has followed very closely. Uh, there has been a project in the industry to reduce the numbers. Uh, we can see in the middle here the project ended uh, from, from quite a good result and then when it ended it, it raised again. So we have had quite a thoroughly discussion with the industry and the companies to look into what to do to reduce uh, the hydrocarbon risk uh, and releases even more. Uh, same with the well control incidents. This is one of the examples showing uh, uh, that it goes a bit up and down. Uh, the same issue here to then have the discussion with the industry. What is behind those numbers? What does it actually mean? And how to further reduce the, both the severity and the numbers. Uh, what we do with all the data uh, that you saw on the first page is actually to not only look at the numbers but also on the severity to be sure that we understand it broader than just just the number. When we look at then the uh, the picture that contains uh, both the number and the severity, we see it actually goes more up and down, and that's because some of the years we had had maybe quite a few numbers, but with higher severity. And this uh, shows then again a trend, a possibility to discuss what to do to both reduce the numbers and the severity. This picture doesn't actually talk about risk directly. And that's because risk is the future. This is history. But what it might tell us is the ability to manage risk in the past. Uh, so when, when this go, goes down, we can say that, okay, they have a ability to reduce uh, the risk, to have put in place uh, measures that uh, gives results. So uh, this is kind of one picture that we use quite a lot of time uh, uh, with the industry to discuss and to follow up on. Another area where we have used quite a lot of time is on barriers. Uh, it's to look at what is in place on different kind of barriers uh, that uh, avoid accidents and incidents to happen. Some of these barriers are uh, really critical uh, uh, safety critical uh, equipment and what we have asked industry is to show the data they have to the testing of different valves, different systems and to uh, uh, show does this uh, equipment function or not. Uh, the axis here is percentage of failure. Uh, 
So in some of these areas, there are quite high fail, fa failure rates uh, for those barriers. And that, again, gives us an opportunity to discuss, OK, why do they fail? What do you do to reduce the failure? And how quite a good discussion on these topics as well. Uh, and I think, uh, if, do we need the data to have that kind of discussions or not? Well, probably uh, we can manage a lot without data, but of course with data, it's easier to point on the specific area. Managing uh, or, or driving us in the direction to be specific, not talking just in a broad sense that we need to reduce the risk. We then know a bit more on where to have uh, the resources and the discussion to uh, find good solutions. So um, what we do then uh, with this trends in risk levels, uh, we uh, make reports uh, every year, every April, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of more data than I showed here. Uh, it's available on a web page. And my colleague Björn Haida is in the audience. He's waving over there. He's the expert in this uh, topic. So he will be here uh, today and tomorrow. And please ask him all the different uh, and difficult uh, <laughs> questions. With that, I'll um, stop with the, my introduction. And I will um, wish that uh, David Kaplan, the leader of NASA, uh, a leader in NASA uh, Johnson Space Center, uh, come up. And he will hopefully give us some thoughts and ideas on how NASA is uh, working in this uh, area. Thank so, you, Anne. Thank you. Well, it's a, <laughs> it is a, truly my privilege to be invited to talk to this forum. I have uh, just delight to be here. Um, there's actually three things that I want to say. So the first is I'm going to describe the International Space Station. And I'm going to try and see if maybe you'll agree with me that it's not a bad analog for a deep water platform drilling in the Arctic or the Gulf of Mexico. Secondly, I'd like to briefly discuss qualitative risk management ideas, because they provide great insight, and there's a lot of value there. But NASA has determined that that doesn't give you the complete answer the optimum way to manage risk. And I'll conclude by talking about quantitative risk techniques that NASA is using um, for both the International Space Station, but also uh, vehicles that we launch to uh, Mars or fly by Pluto. And so I want to give you a sense of what NASA is doing and see how you might uh, envision that as being something of, of use to, to oil and gas. The International Space Station. It is a very large structure, very complex. The word international is not just a meaningless term. Uh, what this map shows is each of the countries for which an astronaut or, or cosmonaut has flown to the space station. The station is principally the, uh, the grouping uh, of Russia, the European Space Agency, Japan, Canada, and the United States. But you can see participation comes from, from all over. It is a very complex structure. I've got a videotape that I'd like to roll now, please, if you would. It's going to last two minutes. So what I want to tell you is that the very first component was launched by Russia, the Zayir, in November of 1998. The station has been continuously occupied by humans since November of 2000. It's taken 115 space flights, which were launched on five different vehicles. The principle, of course, is the space shuttle, which brought up the major components. We consider that the assembly of the station was completed in July of 2011. 
which for no slight reason was also the last launch of the space shuttle Atlantis. We retired the space shuttle fleet when Atlantis landed in July of 2011, bringing the last set of large spare parts to be pre-positioned on this station, things which could not be launched by the smaller vehicles. At this very moment, there are six human beings in the space station. They orbit the Earth every 90 minutes, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. Now, I confess I've never had the, the pleasure or privilege of being on an offshore oil rig. I suspect it might have something to do with the kind of complexity that I just showed there. In terms of size, the space station would uh, cover, well, we'll say an, um, an American football field. I'd use the word soccer for most of the people in the audience, but again, it's just football for everyone. It's not a small structure. It's operated essentially with human beings. There are, are critical, complex operations for which human involvement is essential. There are operations that take place in the most hostile of environments. You cannot get away without doing maintenance in, in activities outside the station. And it's constantly being resupplied. This is one of the vehicles. It happens to be an unmanned uh, vehicle from a company called Space Exploration or SpaceX. And uh, it's called the Dragon, but it's part of a number of vehicles that constantly have to provide resupply to the space station. And if you don't know, it's operating in a pretty isolated uh, part of the universe. You don't get a chance to send a postcard up there anytime you feel like it. Now, oops, I went back. Regretfully and unfortunately, your industry had a moment of epiphany five years ago when a low probability sequence of events occurred. And as I understand it, and I am not a member of your industry, just did a little research, the, the, the assessments that were applied from um, the Macondo reports talk about barrier analysis, um, the Q term Swiss cheese being used, and, 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 and this kind of approach. And your industry is very good at developing fault trees, event trees, reliability block diagrams. All of these are outstanding. And in fact, what I discovered that you all talk about is something called bow ties, which we don't particularly use in, 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 uh, in aerospace at NASA. But I love it. It can give you a very good visceral feel for the overall flow logic of, of activities. Um, NASA will, of course, also use things such as failure modes, effects analysis, and, and everything that we have here. It's not that we use different data, but we've come, to, um, we've come to a different point where we don't think those qualitative approaches are complete. And, and there have been three moments in, in our history uh, similar to how you must have felt when, when you all heard about the, the BP incident. Interesting, the first for us was the Three Mile Island activity. The Nuclear Regulatory Agency came out of that incident with, with the clear idea that they wanted to go to a quantitative approach. They called it probabilistic risk assessment. There are many different terms for it. For this particular talk, I'm going to call it PRA, probabilistic risk assessment. I'm sure that you'll understand what I'm talking about. And at that point, NASA started to think, gee, maybe there's a way to quantify those things that heretofore we couldn't really get our hands around. Then for us, the challenger. On ascent, we found that the design of an O-ring on a solid rocket booster was, was inadequate. We had blow through, and we lost the lives of our crew 73 seconds into ascent. At that point, NASA said, Something has got to be done to assess risk better. Why did this failure occur? How did it get past our management and our engineering chains? It was that epiphany for us. And 
while we brought a lot of things together and started moving down the path, it wasn't with full intent and focus. And when Columbia uh, re-entered the atmosphere um, and tragically exploded due to a piece of foam having ripped a hole into her leading edge, NASA conclusively decided it needed to follow through with, with risk assessments in a quantitative manner. We felt that the, the PRA allowed us to understand some things that we couldn't get from the inductive logic approaches of fall trees, failure modes, effect analysis. It really had to do with understanding uh, human reliability and understanding common cause. So what I've showed here, as, at no way on earth am I going to spend any time to try and explain it. But if we had a few hours and you wanted to have a discussion about how is a PRA conceived, this would be the kind of flow diagram we'd go through. And it's not that NASA owns this. We actually began, uh, as I said, after the nuclear accident. Um, I, I believe Bob Youngblood from Idaho National Labs is in the room. And, uh, and Sapphire, a uh, software uh, a tool which was developed by Idaho National Labs, NASA uh, just plagiarized with, well, plagiarized. We, we took and took and built on Idaho to, to develop this process where what we come up with are, um, are probabilities. And I, my time is running out. I want to show you my last slide to give you a sense of what comes out of this. Now, colloquially, we call these our Band-Aid charts. But in essence, if you, were the, if you were the manager of the space shuttle program, and this is what we showed the very last flight, this shows the key probabilities of a space shuttle uh, having a failure. Now, it has acronyms. I apologize. MMOD is micrometeorite and orbital debris. There are some things for which you cannot eliminate totally the risk. Ask the dinosaurs. A meteorite hit there was really little you can do. Now, yeah, you can change the orientation of the space station if you're going through the Perseides meteor shower. You can do some things, but fundamentally, there are risks that you have to accept. And the leading risk to the space shuttle on its last mission, a 1 in 300 chance, was that a meteorite was going to strike it and we'd lose it. Others, we do have control over, like human error, which I've lumped together. There's a whole set of charts behind this. But there was a 1 in 770 chance that through a human error, we would have lost that last space shuttle. Now, that's something a project manager can do something about. And just parenthetically, I know I'm out of time. If you look at the very bottom one, it says external tank. Well, if this chart had been done before the Challenger accident in 1986, that number would have been way, way, way out to the right. Because we redesigned the O-rings, and in fact the entire external tank, due to a tragedy, it turns out that there's a 1 in 5,000 chance that the, that the uh, external tank would have been the cause of a critical failure. So this is a living document. This document and what the results of the PRA change every single mission, every single time, a rig would change in configuration, your PRA would change. And a project manager can look at this and say, if I've got $100 in my pocket and I want to spend it to reduce risk, how should I spend it? Well, that project manager should not spend it trying to reduce the MMOD. That's not a risk you have a lot of control over. But you sure as heck can look at human error or any of the other things, and with your management team and other data critical to effective management, reach decisions um, with some sense of what the probabilities, the quantitative numbers are. So with that, I have exceeded my time, and I will turn it back over. Thank you. <laughs> Only having 10 minutes to, uh, to go through uh, all you do, or some of what you do, it's, it's uh, not enough, I know. But we'll come back. Uh, the next speaker is Walt Fennell uh, from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, I think you didn't know that you were coming here today. 
I did not. <laughs> so will, uh... we appreciate that you stepped in uh, so, on very short notice. Right. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation extended to my partner, uh, Brian Wardarski uh, from PwC to be here with you today. I will admit that when I woke up this morning, I had not heard of this forum before. Um, <laughs> if somebody had asked me to describe it, I would have been in a complete lack of words for that. I will also admit that after Allison's introduction that this was going to be the high point of the afternoon, I have been dreading uh, my few minutes here in front of you because clearly I will be the low point of this presentation. <laughs> Um, Brian, unfortunately, had a death in his family over the weekend, and so he had to um, attend to family matters. Uh, Brian's immediate backup for this presentation was in a car accident. I completed a rather exhaustive risk analysis before I accept accepted the speaking <laughs> engagement. I uh, made sure that I had my lucky rabbit's foot and my four-leaf clover, and I did several Hail Marys before I crossed the street. Um, to make sure that I did not um, have some horrific accident befall me before um, showing up. Um, I am, I, I will be perfectly honest with you, I'm not a risk management person. I'm a financial statement auditor. I do financial statement audits of the federal, gov of federal government agencies. So well, that means that I work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is an incredibly uh, risk adverse firm. I audit federal government agencies, which inherently are somewhat risk adverse, which means um, I've never seen a risk that I didn't perceive as being real, and I never saw a control that I didn't like. <laughs> Um, so maybe I'll just give you a couple of thoughts to, to think about, um, and, and I don't, and unfortunately because of that lead-in, I don't have any um, very nice videos, um, and I don't have any whiz-bang technology, and unfortunately, as you'll see later on, I don't also play any musical instruments um, <laughs> during my presentation. But, but just a couple of things to think about um, as regulators, and, and some of the things that I've seen working with government agencies doing performance management audits, and then also working with um, federal agencies that um, contract with very large vendors to um, support their missions that, that sort of go along this route. So just bear with me as I, as I, as I stumble my way through this. Um, one, one of the things that I would, that I would um, certainly encourage you all to think about it as you're thinking through this process is to make sure that you understand what, what is the ultimate strategy, what is, the, what is the ultimate objective that you're trying to get at with your risk management policies. And you need to make sure, obviously, that it's crystal clear what those things are and what you're not trying to achieve and what you are trying to achieve, okay? And then